Are we good? I think we're good, and Colin's going to start it, start it off. All right, super. Thanks, Yulin. Yulin is the founder of In Touch Health that works on telemedicine, and I'll let Colin introduce himself. Hey, Colin. Yeah. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Colin Angle, and uh, I am the CEO of iRobot. And I'm very excited. This is my first presentation by robot. So I've been uh, waiting many, many years to be able to get to uh, uh, this stage. So uh, Yulin and I are going to enjoy giving you a little bit of a, a glimpse behind what motivates us and uh, where we think the technology um, uh, for robotics uh, is going to uh, go with respect to telepresence and, in particular, uh, revolutionizing uh, healthcare delivery. So, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of a personal philosophy and, and journey to start to set the stage. It won't take long. Um, but um, uh, if we think about uh, what has uh, motivated me. It certainly starts with a dream, not just a regular dream, but because I'm a robot guy, a robot dream. And the, um, you might think that uh, as a robot guy, the thing that would motivate uh, me would be a robot like R2-D2 or, or C-3PO uh, from, from Star Wars. Uh, right movie, wrong robot. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, you guys recognize uh, the robot that really did it for me, but um, uh, Yulin can show me the, uh, show, uh, uh, the robot in a second. Uh, I'll give you a little history on the robot. There he is right there. Um, this robot was in the original Star Wars. It lived on the Death Star. And uh, the challenge, of course, is the Death Star was new. There was thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of stormtroopers on the Death Star, not robots, and they needed to know where to go. And so that robot that you just saw was a robot that would guide the stormtroopers to where they needed to go to, from where they were. And what made that important for me was when I saw it, I said, look, this is a practical robot that serves a real need and best of yet, we can build it. What you see today is a robot that can do many of the things that robot from Star Wars did. This robot can autonomously map, autonomously navigate, and it certainly made its way out on the podium, not by my driving it, but by clicking uh, a button on the screen called Podium, and the robot was able to find its way to where it needed to go. So this practical bent for robotics has been driving us for, for many years. Uh, and we've looked at other applications where, uh, for many reasons, we felt like there was a need which could be concretely valued. We could come up with a price if we could create a robot solution that could be delivered. And if it all worked out, uh, we could create businesses. And so uh, certainly, if we go through uh, some of the things we've done, uh, I want another way to clean. Well, we've got a robot for that. I want to survive this day and get to the next day. Here's another great application of robotics. I want to live independently. Here's a challenge that I think is facing us all right now. Uh, as a robot industry, I think there's great economic opportunity here. I'm not sure this one is yet solved. Um, but we are working on all of these challenges. Uh, if you think about accomplishments to date, um, I think that we are actually doing better than many people think. Uh, we have actually revolutionized the vacuuming industry. The, uh, in Spain, the number one selling vacuum cleaner in their entire nation is a robot and is the Roomba. Uh, about 10 to 20 percent, depending on where you are, of vacuum sold are now robotic. And so we've accomplished a 
significant shift in how that particular home task is, is, is performed. Um, if you think about on the military side, what have we done? Well, I think we can be very proud that the robots uh, are in theater being used every single day. And because of the work that uh, roboticists around the world uh, have performed, um, many, many more people are alive and able to return home to their loved ones. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the more heavily publicized big wins for uh, robotics, especially telepresence robotics, happened in Japan where uh, some robots were able to go into the uh, Fukushima reactors and accurately map out where the radiation levels uh, were high, where they were within uh, acceptable bounds for someone in a radiation suit, plans of attack could be made, and then ultimately uh, the radiation levels brought down using uh, some larger robots uh, vacuuming up the dust. So we've got a lot going for us so far, as far as winds, and we've created a, a pretty interesting industry. Uh, I think, um, you know, if we go, yeah, that slide, uh, if we think about it, there was just a, research, a recent uh, research report suggesting that consumer robotics was going to reach six and a half billion by 2017. If you've been in the business like I have for a number of years, you take all of these numbers with a significant grain of salt. But uh, I think the level of fantasy in these research reports and the level of momentum that the industry is gaining are starting to come in line with one another. And this isn't a, this isn't a crazy number in Massachusetts alone. Uh, robots accounted for uh, $1.9 billion in sales and have increased very, very substantially uh, since 2008. And venture money, as a result, as you would expect, is starting to travel into the marketplace. So what's, what's next for iRobot? I think that it's very important from our perspective that we attack problems that have real substantial economic value. Why? Very simply because building a robot is very, very expensive to do. Uh, millions and millions of dollars, if not tens of millions of dollars, need to be invested into creating a robot that not just creates a great demonstration, but can actually be a tool used by professionals every day. Uh, I, hopefully, um, uh, I will convince you, and Euland and I, in tandem, will convince you that the robot you see here today is such a robot. And what is it designed to do? Well, it's designed to help attack the challenge of healthcare. Uh, the slide uh, uh, to my right, um, not a new slide, but a shocking slide showing that you know over uh, the past uh, 10, 15 years, the amount of GDP required to support our current level health care has nearly doubled to be 17% of our GDP. It's a ridiculously large amount of money when you think of all of the other industries that help support the United States and help make us what we are. And so there's an appropriately large target. And so that now that we have new and practical tools in the form of robots, the mission is to try to uh, apply this technology and really have an impactful difference like we do with vacuum cleaners. So Yulin has been uh, graciously advancing my slides. I'd like to elevate his status from slide advancer to Vanna White, and then I will uh, advance it once again and, and let him deliver the meat of the presentation. But if Yulin could uh, point out some of the amazing features on this robot, it was designed not just to provide the video conferencing uh, system that uh, I'm uh, speaking through, it's really designed to allow intimate interactions that a doctor might want to have with a patient. So if I need to uh, use a stethoscope, well, the robot has one. 
if I need to have a private conversation, uh, well, the robot has a built-in handset. It has interfaces for uh, many other sensors to plug into, and the user, probably the most uh, exciting bit of technology that you can't see is the uh, user um, control panel that I'm uh, operating the robot from, which actually can be hooked into a hospital's information system, allowing me to pull up patient information, allow me to see in real time data that might be streaming off of local instruments the patient might be hooked up to, and also without any training. And I'm going to show that allow next a doctor. Moment. What's that? Oh, I'm there you go. I'm going to show that, yeah. Okay, so without further ado, you've seen this hardware up close. Um, Yulin Wang uh, will take it from here. Yulin has been at the intersection of healthcare and technology since the beginning of his career when he founded Com Computer Motion, and along with that, the in invention of ASOP, the first FDA-cleared surgical robot. So he's been at this robot healthcare thing for quite some time. He's an amazing entrepreneur and inventor. And so uh, with that, Yulin, uh, why don't you take us on a remote journey? Thank you, Colin. So uh, what you can't see, haven't been able to see yet, is Colin's side. And there's actually been a lot of discussion here about how we need to leverage uh, two, two points which have been made uh, throughout the day. One is the leveraging of consumer electronics. And the second is actually the, how easy things have to be to use. So that's cer certainly something I've learned in my last uh, actually 25 years in robotics and healthcare is how easy things have to be for physicians. Uh, not because they're, uh, they're not capable, it's because they want to focus on the task at hand. So what I ha am holding here is an iPad mini, and you see that projected. And what we have here is an icon which is downloadable from the um, iStore, from the Apple Store. I'll go ahead and type in my password. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, go, and, and now I'm actually going out to the cloud, and I'm checking what systems I can connect to. And I'm going to go ahead and check to, so uh, Colin actually didn't mention that he's actually currently in Boston. And now what I'm doing is I'm connecting to a robot just like this, but it's in my office in, in, down in Santa Barbara. It's a place where we do a lot of uh, training and demonstration, so it, it looks like a hospital environment. It looks like there's someone over there. In fact, this is, this is our trainer. He's actually training somebody else uh, right now. Um, but you can see how I can look through. Um, I can look through the robot. And uh, there's someone actually going right where I was going to go. So I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go over and head over to a, um, to a patient's bedside. OK, so, so what's the point here? I'm playing the role of a, a physician. And I just tapped on a list. I don't know if you saw that. I tapped on a list, and I think we called her Patient Jones. So this is uh, Patient Jones. She, she, you know, you can tell she looks the same all, all, at all time. And so, <laughs> but you can see how I can actually, I'm just using my finger on the iPad mini. I'm standing by the foot of the bed and you can see how I can zoom right in up on her eye. I can actually um, go ahead and here's like a vital signs monitor uh, right next to her. So I can go ahead and I can zoom in. I can check out what's going on the vital signs. I can actually, hey Chris, how's it going? Hi, <laughs> so I'm giving a little demo here. So here, here's like, a, um, you know, an x-ray. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't need to talk to a live person, so. But as Colin was saying, too, I can actually pull up things like the chart. I can pull up uh, the patient's vital signs. I might pull up some imagery or look on the screen, as I was just doing. I might um, even look at the, the labs of the patient. And so the point is, is I, as a remote physician, wherever I am, I can go ahead and... Um, and provide care, okay, to, to, to that patient wherever they are. When I'm done, 
I just hit dock, and, uh, or I, even if I log off, it would just go back and dock itself, so it is autonomously driving. And uh, we don't have to, we don't, if, we don't have to sit here and watch this, but I always find it kind of fun. So we're going to go ahead, and it's going to go ahead and dock itself. Uh, by, so there it goes. And uh, it's backing itself up in. And there, there it go, went ahead and docked itself. And now I can go ahead and, uh, and um, log off. So that, so that gives you both sides. That gives you the side, the patient sees, which you're seeing here with, uh, with Colin. And then it also gave you the side that Colin sees, which is where the clinician is. So I'll give a few, um, you know, a, few, a few comments about where this all fits. And I'm going to start. This is, uh, this is something some of you may know, uh, probably some of you don't know. It's actually pretty spectacular, is that actually if you start from the Bronze Age, about 3000 BC, up through about the 1800s, average life expectancy was in the 30 years time frame. So we would not have a room of people here, right? <laughs> and it started in about that time, moving forward till now, because of the progress of modern medicine, uh, life expectancy is going up about one year for every four to five calendar years. It's almost, uh, it's almost a, an analog to uh, Moore's Law. There, if you start right around the year 1900 and you go forward till now, it's about uh, 30 years or uh, of 30, 35 years of increased life expectancy, and that curve actually hasn't uh, slowed down yet. And, and, there's, and it's probably not going to. The, the problem that has created, though, is that we live these longer lives, which we're all, I think, very grateful for, but it's created a cost uh, structure which is, which, is, which is crushing the economy. And it, that, that's the first point tying back to jobs here. If you don't have a viable economy, you're gonna have a real problem with, um, with uh, jobs. And so here's just a few of the different graphs in terms of the, the one which is always shown from a political standpoint is the lower right one. If you don't so-called bend the curve in a few decades, we're going to be spending not 17% of the GDP, but 50% of the GDP on health care costs, which is obviously very problematic. So the question is, how do you continually improve quality of care, which is what we want? How do you get it available to all? Health care reform is putting another 35 to 40 million people into the system. And how do you lower costs all at the same time? Difficult problem. It's really uh, given a lot of people a lot of time to do a lot of heavy thinking to figure out how to do this. I would suggest to you robotics plays a key role in this in the form of what's called telemedicine. Telemedicine is about getting the right expertise, the right place, the right time to do the right thing. And the point is, is if you just, if you didn't even advance medical science Further, if you just stopped it where it is today, but you always delivered best practices, you would actually significantly improve quality and lower costs. And that's what we're all trying to do. And I would suggest to you that there is a way to do that now. It didn't exist uh, 15 years ago prior to the internet. It, it is available now because we have this wonderful thing of, of, of bandwidth available everywhere at a low cost, you can now do things like get the clinician to the patient anywhere. You can also equip that clinician with all the necessary information because information is now electronic. There are, you have tools, uh, Cullen showed you the stethoscope. One of the commonly used devices in this scenario um, is actually an ultrasound. An ultrasound, you plug in an ultrasound, you, there's actually a port on the side. You can plug in an ultrasound on the side, and you can actually do a, a real-time ultrasonic image. But the point is you can do diagnostic, you can do therapeutics, you can look at the information, you can do it from anywhere, and, 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 and then you leverage the expertise of the physician. I don't think the physician's going away anytime soon. The physician is really the coach of the, of the patient to continually help guide that person through a very complex maze of the healthcare system and different disease states. I'll give you an example of how 
this is used to, this is a new robot which, um, which uh, iRobot and InTouch has been collaborating on for over two years and we're very excited about it. But InTouch has been doing this remote presence for a while. We're in about 800 hospitals. Here's a little video of, a, of an earlier, of the predecessor version in an application. We deal with uh, acute injuries in blood vessels in the And Mr. Rhodes. Uh, you were particularly weak in the left arm and left leg last night and couldn't do that. Right. I think I'm missing half of the soundtrack. You're able to above the bed. What's happening here, I'm going to turn the sound off because it's only playing half of it, but what's happening here is a stroke neurologist from his apartment is assessing a stroke patient who's in the hospital. Stroke right now is our biggest application because it is a situation where you have a patient suffering an unscheduled event, it's hard to get the right specialist there quickly, and if you can, it's a life or death event. And so that's actually where we're, we're seeing it. This is a typical kind of layout, which we're in, as I mentioned, we're in about 800 hospitals now, and they're generally situated in hub-spoke uh, 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 situations. The star, this, that's a picture of the state of Michigan, the star is a larger tertiary hospital. The dots surrounding it are smaller, what we call spoke hospitals. The tertiary hospital brings the specialists and subspecialists to the outline spoke hospitals to take care of patients, for example, stroke patients who get brought in there from the surrounding community. And, and these surrounding communities don't have access to these specialists otherwise. This is actually created, uh, you know, it, so, so it actually improves jobs out in the tertiary, er, out in the surrounding area because it's actually enabling these spoke hospitals to do higher levels of care than they otherwise would have been able to do. That, I talked about stroke, but this is applicable to lots of different specialties. This is a picture of another network that we've got in the Idaho uh, uh, Oregon area and you can see two different columns of all these different specialties which are being pushed through this hub spoke network. Not only stroke, but neonatology, psychiatry, burn management, et cetera, et cetera. These are all situations where you have a specialist that's hard to access and you can get them to that whole network of hospitals quickly if there becomes a patient who's in need. Now, uh, to end this, you know, the, the question is, oh, so what we've talked about is using remote presence in a telemedicine scenario to enable access, but the reality is you can actually take it much further than that. You can take it, this is meant to stair step through continued advancement of robotics in uh, healthcare delivery. The next step that's on this sheet here is from enabling access to coordinating care, and the next step after that is what we would call preemptive care, and preemptive care is actually when the robot is starting to do certain things on its own. So we, we, we can see a future which is stair-stepping through these different uh, um, 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 kind of progressions. And so to end, I'm going to show a quick little animation of what a coordinating care scenario might look like. Is there sound on this? In today's challenging environment, hospitals need to improve quality of care while lowering cost. But placing more demands on fewer resources limits their ability to do this. Fortunately, tomorrow's hospitals will be able to overcome these obstacles with RP Vita, a revolutionary remote presence robot that will change the way care is delivered. In the future, a nurse will use RP Vita to check on a patient waiting for transfer to a crowded ICU. Traveling there by itself, RP Vita will identify the patient using facial recognition or by scanning an RFID band. After documenting the patient's condition and collecting other vital information, RP Vita will make this information available to clinicians who can continue monitoring the patient until they're ready to be moved. RP Vita will assist doctors on call too directed to a patient's bedside by a nurse using the RP Vita app, 
RP Vita will access patient data, notify the doctor to join in, and provide them with the informatics they need to perform a complete patient evaluation. RP Vita will also monitor patients who've previously been flagged for observation by automatically proceeding to the patient at the designated time and alerting a nurse to log in and use their smartphone to evaluate or check on them. When patients are ready for discharge, RP Vita can help prepare them by providing instructional videos and other information and allow them to interact with discharge planners, patient advocates and others. These are just a few of the ways RP Vita will soon be helping hospitals provide better care more cost effectively by making remote presence routine. So I think that's it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. All right, thanks. Sure, my pleasure.